All right, good afternoon and, and thank you for joining our international symposium today. This session is educational efforts designed to promote student involvement in international trade. I'd like to introduce our two speakers today, Philip Seng, who's an affiliate professor of animal science and Brad Morgan, professor of animal science. So uh, with that, we've got 50 minutes for an excellent session and I'll turn it over to our speakers. There is a Q&A chat box below. So if you've got any questions during the sessions, feel free to add them there. Thank you so much and let's go ahead and get started. Okay, thanks Sarah. Let's see here guys. There we go. Well, guys, uh, again, thank you. And Phil and I are happy to be with you today. And we're going to quickly go through some things uh, from an international perspective standpoint. Traditionally, uh, whenever you train students in an international environment, whether it be about trade or in what we work in, in the animal sciences area, especially in the meat science or the beef cattle industry, most of the work that's been done in the past of training students was in graduate school. When Phil ran the U.S. Meat Export Federation, we were fortunate enough here at Colorado State to be able to partner with that organization and do some fantastic research projects uh, uh, around the world. And it was great experience for us as well as our students. Today, today what we want to share with you is uh, just a little bit, just to set up some stuff. And then I'm going to turn it over to Phil to talk about what we're doing on campus here at Colorado State to try to train students in a new particular way. Uh, what we're wanting to do now is that uh, is just let you know that obviously people around the world are eating more meat. People are having the access to be able to order or buy or purchase more meat. You see the United States, we're just kind of the status quo. The world's growing as far as meat demand about 2.7%. But you can see the countries to the right of that. Poland, Argentina, Turkey, Egypt, Iran. Of course, we hear a lot about China and how they're wanting to increase their demand for red meat anywhere from eight to 10%. Uh, so again, the world's getting larger and also the people around the world are getting more access to be able to purchase more product. That's why it's important that people understand, especially here in the United States, just because something works in Houston, Texas, does not necessarily mean it'll work in Hong Kong, for instance. So we're wanting to make sure not only to teach students about meat trade, but also some of the cultural differences around the world. Traditionally, there's been a lot of examples and opportunities to the American Meat Science Association, from the Foreign Ag Service, from the Peace Corps, from USDA APHIS for students, and mainly graduate students, to get some opportunities around the world in some type of international exposure. Again, we like trying to get people excited and fired up and interested about uh, international opportunities from an undergraduate perspective. The course we're going to talk to you about some today later uh, involves both undergraduate as well as graduate students. Uh, traditionally, as I mentioned, we've done a lot of stuff over the years from research. Uh, this is an article that was published in Poland a few years ago, and they talk about synergies between academic, academics and industry work has always been driven uh, during research efforts whenever we work with the industry. We partner with the industry a lot uh, because one, it's real world, two, it's a great opportunity, and three, it's a good opportunity for our students to eventually get a job once they complete their graduation. Here's just some examples, pictures. This was in Uruguay. So of our students in packing plants, this is one he's changing, uh, trying to get the vehicle unstuck. Uh, should tell you the young man in the picture there with the brown pullover on, he's a vice president now at Cargill, but this was one of the projects he was involved in there. Here's some projects again in Japan. This was one that I mentioned to you that we did with Phil and the U.S. Meat Export Federation uh, in, in Tokyo and other places around the world. So opportunities like this. This was a student actually that we got, actually we got to know the gentleman in the middle. He is a fourth generation meat cutter in Tokyo. Uh, and he ended up after we got to work with him, he actually came to Colorado State and worked on a master's degree in the meat science area here in animal science. So it works both ways and it's good experience in, uh, for our students to be able to work hand in hand with international students as well. You would wonder why we would be doing research in Egypt 
this is a Egypt, believe it or not, uh, they, they, they consume a large percentage of the beef livers in the world. So again, we wanted that market. You can sell a beef liver in Egypt for a lot more money than you can in the United States. So we wanted to be the leaders in that particular area as well. This is Dr. Belk, our department head in Japan after we had the BSC uh, outbreak or problem here in the United States, using science that we had conducted through research to talk about exactly what the United States is doing in order to make sure where we can have access back to that marketplace. So here's just a list of some projects that we've done over the years. And uh, we've got more than this, but it just shows you some of the things that we've done around the world, training students from an international perspective uh, from a research standpoint. Obviously, we go to a lot of meetings as well. We try to take our students to one international meeting a year. Obviously, with COVID, that's sort of stopped in many ways. But however, we will be taking some of our students this year. Uh, it's actually, Phil, going to be in Kobe, Japan, the International Congress of Meat Science and Technology. So again, that's another opportunity for them to present, to meet people, and to understand cultures of the world. This is some of our undergraduates in the judging contest that was held in Australia. So again, they went there, they competed against teams from Australia, United States, Korea, Taiwan, and Mexico, and our team was fortunate enough to win that contest. So again, a great experience for them. What about exchange programs, uh, internships? And again, we've had several of those opportunities. Uh, for our people to go. And this is in Japan again, uh, where we did some work and we had an exchange program, their students for our students. And it was an excellent opportunity. I guess that kind of leads to kind of where we're at today. How can we in, entice students to get them interested into international exposure, international exchange, international marketing, and also just learning more about people around the world in the classroom. And that's what I want Phil to go ahead and talk about today. This is a class that we taught for the first time uh, last year. It's called Exploring Meat Op Export Opportunities. Uh, it's an interesting class and in that we meet on Mondays and Wednesdays, uh, noontime here uh, in the Animal Science Department. And then on Fridays, what we will do is we have a, a lab that's uh, generally it's online and it's later in the afternoon or evening because we may uh, invite some of our international friends around the world to participate in that webinar where our students can interact. And we've got some examples of that that Phil will show you here in just a second. So again, again Mr. Phil Singh. Well, good morning or good afternoon. It's my pleasure to, to be with you this afternoon. Uh, I would first of all like to commend Dr. Belk and Dr. Morgan for their vision, for the idea that they, uh, they recognize the importance of international trade and they recognize also the importance of knowledge, of how important it is to really differentiate opinions, uh, because where does opinion begin and fact begin? And, and the point is, I think that we have a lot of people that have a lot of opinions, but, uh, but what are the true facts? And I think uh, Colorado State, uh, which, uh, which is a very august institution to begin with, has done a commendable job over all these years in advancing the US trade interests around the world. And uh, just this year, we reached about $18 billion in trade of US beef, pork, and lamb. And uh, that's really a milestone when, when we take a look at uh, the, the competition, when we take a look at some of the obstacles that's been faced. But a lot of that's done as a result of a lot of good groundwork that's been, been laid. And, there's an old, uh, old saying in Chinese, one generation plants the trees and the next generation gets the shade. And I think that when we take a look at this, a lot of the work and a lot of the hard work, the, 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 the exploration, the, the uh, research uh, that was done, not only by our, our people at US Meat Export Federation, but the entire industry, and especially Colorado State, it really, it really stands out and we're, and we're paying and we're seeing the dividends of that today. I think uh, one of the things about this whole effort that I think is cr critically important is uh, promoting student involvement in international trade. It's a wonderful subject to, to address. And I really feel that there's probably two areas or two, two attributes that are really important to be successful in international trade. And one of them would be intellectual curiosity. I think people, when they go and 
face a situation, they go to any given country, and I've been to probably over 100 countries around the world, and many of them many, many, many times over, um, to, to be curious about how did we get to this point? What, what are the drivers of change in this market? Is change coming from internal dynamics, external dynamics? I mean, you really have to probe to really understand markets. And that leads to the next thing that I think is critically important in markets is cultural fluency. Uh, people have to recognize that when you're dealing with Japan, China, Europe, a lot of these areas, you're not just talking to markets, you're talking to cultures. They have their own food culture. So the more that you as students and the people that are involved on this call can probe more deeply and understand more than just science, but understand the, the, the languages, the cultural, uh, the, the, the policies, the business practices, the, the whole array of interests, this is going to prepare you very, very well as you go into international affairs in the future. And I've often said to some students that, you know, a lot of people, they go to school, they want, well, they would like to go to work for Cargill or Tyson or JBS. But the most, the, the best thing that you can do for Tyson, JBS, or any company that you go to work for is maybe do an internship with one of their major customers. And if you understand their customers, you will be of tremendous service to any company that you work for. So I would really ask you and really implore you as you look at the international marketplace, have that intellectual curiosity and drive yourself as much as you can to understand and gain that cultural fluency, which is critical in a market. Uh, maybe we can go on to the next slide then. then. Well, Phil, I just want to go ahead and interject real quickly because I knew you're, you're too humble. You all will notice in that picture of Phil, it says CSU professor Philip Singh awarded Japan's highest civilian honor Order of the Rising Sun. This was an award that's given to civilians, the highest award given to civilians, uh, and it's by the emperor's family. And I know Phil was very disappointed that he could not go back to Japan. Uh, he lived in Japan for about 10 years whenever we were trying to get things established in Japan. But this is a, a very, it's a cool honor a neat honor, uh, and very few people in the United States have received that award. So obviously, Phil is very much so um, very uh, experienced, and, uh, and I'm, I'm very happy to be able to teach this class with him here at Colorado State. Yeah. Well, I would say that, you know, trade, I appreciate those, those kind words. And I think the reason that uh, maybe as we go through this presentation that you'll understand maybe why I received this award was that I, a lot of my work I did was with the Japanese companies. When I said work with Cargill's customers or work with JBS's customer, back in my day it was Montfort, but, but in the days uh, I was working with all their customers and we were, we were working at developing strategies and these types of things to, to go forward. If your customers are successful, you can bet you're going to be successful. And so that's really the, the lesson that I learned to be really market driven as opposed to being funding driven or maybe even what you'd call producer or processor driven. I was really customer driven, market driven. I think that's really where that, that recognition came and rec was recognized by the Japanese, which I, I strongly appreciate. But I think the other thing is, and it sounds like a philosophy class to some degree, but you know, if you go back to the ancient Greeks, you go back to wherever, people are always trying to seek the truth. And the truth is very important in trade because if you have truth in trade, that's the, 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 the foundation for having trust in trade. And I think right now there's so much misinformation that goes on in this world. It's really hard for people to understand the truth, but to, but to discern the truth, you really have to go to the market. You have to see the customer. And the customers will let you know Basically, if you're in a business situation, you're either going to sell or not sell. But that's usually the, the, the real definer of truth in trade is, 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 is the customer. And so I asked the question, you know, why is, why is there so much concern? Why are people so concerned about trade? Because after all, if you just look at the, the translation or the, the definition of trade, it just involves the transfer of goods and services from one entity to another. Uh, often exchange for barter or for currency. It's just a simple exchange. And so if you go to the next slide, um, you know, as you do trade and trade again, you know, when you look at children at 10 months old, um, I have grandchildren and I had children, of course, 
And they start trading with each other at the age, in 10 months. So it seems to be kind of a natural occurrence. But it seems like as we start trading among nations and we start doing some of these things, we look at balances and, and we look at uh, some of these other interactions, but it's really globalization is just the process of the interaction uh, between countries and individuals uh, worldwide. And, it, and, and promoting these interactions to me are, are very, very important. The next slide basically, I, I wanna just underscore that global trade is not a new phenomenon. I mean, when, when man first domesticated the camel and the horse, and we're talking 3,000 years ago, he started to trade. And, and, and that trading continued, and it, there was sea trade, there was land trade. And then as you, as you got into even the time of, of the Roman Empire, and you got to, to these empires that were like, uh, you had this from 1000 BC to maybe 1500 AD, you had these empires, you had the, the famous Silk Road, which is now the Belt Road that uh, Xi Jinping is trying to advocate today. But you had the Han Dynasty in China, you had the Tang Dynasty in China, and you had all the, you had Alexandria, you had all these different, the Egyptians and all this stuff. A lot of this was flourishing because of trade. But the real thing that changed trade uh, was what I would call the ocean trade. And that occurred from about 1500, 1498, when Columbus sailed the ocean blue, they say. But if you go for that next two, 300 years, this was really an enlightening period because this is where man circumvented the globe. He found out actually that the earth is not flat. He found out that, uh, that the sun is the center of the universe. All these things had major philosophical implications. But because of the global trade, we saw this huge expansion and this burst of uh, the, the new world splendor, for example, that people realized there was this whole thing called the Americas. It wasn't known that at, at that time as the Americas, but there was a huge change in religion. Philosophy changed, art changed, music changed, literature changed, science changed. And so because of trade, because of this trade exploration, you saw many, many changes that occurred. And of course, with that, with trade, there are the, the, there are the problems. Uh, as we traded, we traded in animals, we traded in plants, we also traded in pathogens, disease. And so as, as the world expanded, if you will, from Europe and outward, um, some of the ills of, uh, of, an, of, uh, of, of society of production also were, were transferred. And so we, we, we've seen there's the pluses and the minuses to trade. And then of course, as you go through the history, you get into the, uh, the uh, from World War II, the current uh, apparatus that we're trading under. And then in 2000, some people would call this the post-industrial phase, but trade really, really grew. And, and what I really mean by this whole slide is that trade basically is in our DIA. And trade is something that shouldn't be ignored. It's, it's something that shouldn't be in, avoided. Uh, it's something to embrace. And the question is, how can the Yankee traders, as we used to be called, how can we get that all back again? And, uh, and I think this is really what this class is all about, is taking a look at trade and looking at it for what it is and how we can advantage the United States and how other countries can advantage themselves. Because actually trade is not a win-lose situation. The best trade agreements that I witnessed in my 50 years of, of looking at this stuff, and then also from history, where both countries win. And a win-win situation is a lasting situation. The next, the next question, of course, is the next slide. And that's where we are. We, you know, the United States evolves from election to election. And you can see that we had in 2016, we had a change. And of course, the, I think the Trump administration questioned everything, every, every established thing that we could imagine from the w World Health Organization to the Iran thing, but also trade agreements. Uh, we, it was a different kind of a situation that we had as far as uh, it, it didn't support, for example, maybe the global uh, apparatus that was developed after World War II. And so it threw things into a kind of a head spin as far as politics and politics doesn't really work well in the trade game, if you will. Uh, when, you, this, when you look at this slide, you can see there's the capital and uh, it's red and it's blue. And uh, in that alone, it makes it difficult. 
but because you can't come to agreement sometimes on these traded deals. And in, and in the United States, we have this thing called the, uh, the uh, Permanent Trade Authority, where that has to be passed by the Congress. And this has been allowed to lapse. And that's, that means if the USTR, our government negotiates with another government, our Congress can't change the agreement. They either have to vote yes or no with, when you have the Permanent Trade Authority. That is lapsed. So that's going to make it extremely difficult going forward in this administration uh, to do what I would call consequential uh, trade agreements. Um, if we keep going further, um, this is a letter that uh, Bud Middow, he's passed away, but he was the first chairman of the U.S. Meat Export Federation. And I really compliment Bud because he's the gentleman who pulled the United States industries together. It would be the pork industry, the beef industry, the packers, the grain industry, all the components of the U.S. Meat Export Federation, oil seeds, uh, all came together. And he was a man who pulled all this together with the vision and with others, of course, who had that vision, Bill McMillan, who just passed away a year ago. But they, they had this vision that we could be very successful internationally. And so what, what, what they did basically was set the, the apparatus domestically for us to go forward. When they hired me, I had been living in Japan. I'd already worked, I'd had a master's degree in East Asian studies. I'd worked for the Japanese ministry, foreign ministry. I had exposure uh, to Japanese education. I taught in a Japanese university briefly. I'd worked in the foreign ministry. So, and I also worked for a Japanese company. So when I came, I came from the position of the Japanese market. I came from the Japanese position I say I thought like a Japanese, but I understood Japanese thinking, the rationale, their language, and what I like to call, I, I possessed at a rudimentary level, cultural fluency in Japan. And this is really important because I could understand how the Japanese viewed things. And especially when the United States would engage Japan because of the language, which helps you understand how they formulate positions and this type of thing in their thinking process. This really helped the United States as we d developed and tried to gain more market insight, how the Japanese system works. And so understanding first, the US system was, was something that was a little bit difficult for me. I grew up on a farm in Iowa. So I was under, I understood agriculture, but I surely didn't understand the way the Washington apparatus works. And you have the US government at those days, and you still do, of course, you have the US NEF, you have US exporters, and they all, at that time, MEF had a Washington office and we were very active internationally and in, in, in internationally, but also in Washington. Because at that point in time, in the early eighties, there wasn't a lot of interest in, in trade. Uh, there were a few, few people who were very progressive who had a vision and said, there is, there's room for us in these international marketplaces. But, um, but it, it was a long time in coming. But what you look at the situation today is there are many hands that are involved in trade. But when you take a look at this, how many of these people have what you'd call cultural fluency? How many of these people across these organizations have experience in these markets? How many people have, have what I would call a good meats background? Because actually marketing is creation. And so when we look at the international markets, it's not trade policy, it's not just a Washington thing, where it just it's, resides in Washington, you have to understand the market you're appealing to. And a lot of times, if you have in the market who will support the position that you're taking because it's in their own self-interest. So if we go to the next slide, I've always looked at the, the markets, and I'm hoping I'm moving along fast enough, kind of like a football field. You, you know, on the left side here, on the 10-yard line to the left, maybe that's kind of where we're parked as the industry. But, it, but as you progress through the market, you have the distribution system. And, and the consumers are maybe at the other end zone, 90 yards away. And so what are the factors that are involved in getting to the consumer? And if you take a look at the next slide, then you'll see here there's a book where I took a look at the, the Japanese market. I wrote the first book on Japanese beef and the first book on Japanese pork so people would understand the process of selling to Japan, what's involved in that. So then if you fishbone the Japanese market, this becomes something that was unheard of back in those days and still to a large degree today, you'll have the Japan meat industry, but who is in the industry? Well, you have 
in the U.S. Embassy, of course, in a market. This, and I'm using Japan because that was really the first market that we really aggressively went into. But you have, of course, an embassy in all countries. You have exporters that, that have varying degrees of exposure in these markets. And then, of course, you have the MEF. But then as you get further into the market, it's not just a question of saying, well, we want to have this market open. Maybe the foreign ministry might understand where you're coming from because they have people in the embassy in Washington and this type of thing. But the producers under MAF, for example, the Ministry of Agriculture, are going to be vehemently against liberalization. And there might be the prime minister's office who maybe has a friendship with the president. He doesn't really take a position. And, and so what you have is already when you go into a market division, you have different ministries that are not agreeing with other ministries. So already you, you, you have a, a challenge ahead of you. And that's not just to open up a market. If you have BSE, if you have any kind of affliction with, with any kind of disease or, or a stoppage, or a, if you had uh, African swine fever in the market, you're going to have division within any country, within any government that you deal with. Then you have the trade, you have distributors, for example, and um, you have wholesalers and you have processors and you have purveyors. And then under them, they sell to different, depending on their makeup, different retailers and department stores, and it goes on down the line. And so when you get involved in all of this, there, there's different people in those days that had quota and different people who didn't have quota. So the idea there was, how do you franchise the people who don't have the quota? And that's what we did. We worked with many of these kinds of people in order to work to open up the market. But there's also official organizations that you work with and there's influencers. And so when, when you get into a market, there's the press, there's, there's what we called K, KOLs, key opinion leaders. And there's all this that goes into the makeup of a market and that all has to be addressed and the people that are basically at math, the people in the foreign ministry, the prime minister's office, they're watching the politics. They're watching to see how this is going. So, so it becomes very difficult in a market when you're trying to change the status quo, when you're trying to do something at the border, it becomes quite difficult. So let's go to the next slide. On this slide, as we did this kind of study, all of a sudden, I remember the Harvard Business School became very interested in what we were doing because they, uh, they, that this had been unprecedented taking this kind of a look at a market. And so we did a series of lectures at Harvard talking about the Japanese distribution system and, and working uh, with, with Harvard basically on some different studies. And one of the things that, that, we, that I found out working in Japan was that you could eliminate the border protection. You could lower tariffs and duties but because of the complexity of that distribution system that I just saw you, you might not sell any more product. So there was a lot of work that we did, not only on opening up the border, that was the beginning, but doing work to open up further into the Japanese market. And some of those changes that we did at that time actually were, were very significant in allowing the chain store associations. They had chain store laws. They had laws limiting where you could have uh, convenience stores. And all of this changed because we took a case uh, before uh, uh, with Japan, Senator Max Baucus, who's a good friend of the industry from Montana, led, led a study on this and Japan did change their laws, which allowed for the proliferation of chain stores, supermarkets, and a lot of these things, which of course helped us to export more meat. If you go on further, um, you'll see that uh, the, the key to what we were doing was trying to provide the U.S. MEF Denver with factual information about Japan. We also tried to provide the U.S. government factual information because it's only be when you have facts, basically, that, that companies will make moves. They don't engage, they don't change policy, they don't change and do new things because of a hunch and a guess or someone's opinion. They want to be fact-based when they do things. So if we're going to be an organization or you're going to work for a company in the future when you graduate, the more you can have facts, the more you can understand the market, the, the, more, the more support you're going to receive from whoever you're working for, because that's really what makes the difference. And then we introduced the U.S. leaders, uh, both industry and government, to really the realities of what's going on in Japan. And of course, the idea was always to become the most reliable source on Japan 
to the US industry and government. And that, that, that was key. Next, you can see here, within a period of time, uh, that's me on the left, but that's Ambassador Mansfield, who was the longest serving ambassador to Japan. Uh, he was a, a great ambassador. And then you had, the, the at that time, the, the chairman of the USMEF and Manley Mopus, the chairman of the National Meat Association, which used to be called the AMI. And we, so we had dignitaries coming to Japan at the highest levels. We were working very positively, trying to underscore our commitment to the Japanese, our reliability as a supplier to Japan. And all this went into this, uh, this commitment that we, that we were making. And as you go further here, uh, as we got further involved in the market, then we, we started an evolution as far as uh, the marketing that we were doing. In those days, in the beginning, we were marketing a commodity. It was U.S. beef. And it was uh, hopefully choice U.S. beef was, was what Japanese really wanted to have. But as the market started to, to develop and as more product was coming into the market, retailers wanted to differentiate their product from their competitors. So the idea of differentiation from just a general commodity started in Japan. And so what we started and seeing was in Japan was this evolution of store brands. So going from a commodity and stores would say, well, here's our brand. And this is the Seiyu brand or the Dai brand or the Ito Yokoto brand. And they would start this brand differentiation. And then after a while, the Packers started to realize as they're selling to these customers, if they could do a Packer brand, and a lot of that was basically sorting carcasses on the rail, getting top choice or doing whatever, but you started to see that kind of a sort going on. And then at the same time, the United States had just started doing a lot of work on chilled product. Prior to the time that we were involved in the negotiations, all product going to Japan was in a frozen state, which is not always the best condition to ship product. So we knew that Japan liked fresh food, fresh vegetables, fresh fruits, fresh fish, fresh everything. So we worked with Colorado State, with other leading universities, to develop this chilled ability to sell chilled product to Japan. And this really distinguished what we were doing and of course with brands. And then as you were doing a chilled program, you could do a branded program. And this really helped proliferate US sales of beef initially in the market. And of course it helped to proliferate sales of US pork in, into the market. And so, as you take a look at the Japanese market, it was a market that really was one of the first ones to develop for us. And it was a market that a lot of what we learned in Japan, we could also apply in Korea because Korea had a very similar situation. And so the development model for Japan was also applied to Korea. And at the same time, uh, this is not new. We were always looking at market differentiation because at one point in time, 90% of our exports of beef and pork went to Japan. So in 1984, I went to Japan basically in 1982, uh, we started looking at, at China. And it's interesting, just 50 years ago this week, Nixon and Kissinger went to China to open up that market. And at that point in time, the average GDP of a Chinese was less than $150 a year. Uh, it was a communist country. They didn't own any of the land. Uh, all the land, everything is owned by the state. But uh, once they opened up, once Nixon and Kissinger went to China and that market opened, there was a very, 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 very forthright and a very uh, brilliant gentleman named Deng Xiaoping. And he started what they called the responsibility system. And so Chinese could grow X amount for the state and then they, they could keep the rest of that. And that's him on the left. They could keep the rest of that uh, for themselves and to sell it. And, and in my opinion, the Chinese are very, very much a capitalistic type people. They know how to make money. They know how to work. And so as, as China began to gradually open up its doors, of course, their first interest was trading. They wanted to export everything they produced as mu pretty much. But to be very frank, um, it was a market that was very much in its embryonic stage. And uh, I think that w when we first of all worked to get China into the WTO back in 1991, that was a very, very enthusiastic time because people thought at that time China would then comport and conform totally with international trading rules and, and disciplines and this type of thing. 
Of course, over time, that didn't prove to be the case, but there was a lot of euphoria about China and the opening of China, the size of the market and the potentials in that market. And, and today, I think just like back then, people are still trying to understand the Chinese market. They're trying to understand how to, how to work in the Chinese market. And I think it was very positive, the growth in the Chinese market until basically the current president or the current premier in China, uh, he's, he's, been, uh, he's been a little bit difficult uh, as far as clamping down and, and trying to make China number one. But a lot of this comes from the Chinese history itself. But we had a lot of teams go to China. We, uh, we did a lot of work in China. The Packers opened up offices in China. Uh, we had a meat school in China, in, uh, in Shanghai. Uh, we trained a lot of people on, 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 on basically on cutting product, uh, on using the meat buyer's guide, for example. Uh, there was a lot of training that went on in those early years. Of course, all this stopped when, when we got BSC and it took us about 17 years then to re-enter the Chinese market. But, um, but the Chinese market still today, this is the number one market for beef, it's the number one market for pork, it has tremendous appeal. And so when I talk about cultural fluency, you can see here, there's a man named Sam Harada. We hired him in Japan and he's, he's in Tokyo right now. But um, this is a tape of him um, in one of the first classes that we were having talking about Japanese Wagyu. And this is another uh, product that's a unique product to some degree as far as the beef industry is concerned, but it's the pride and joy of Japan. And Japan has stepped up their efforts at marketing and uh, they wanna market more of their product internationally. And so we'll, let's hear from Sam if it's okay right now. Yeah, and, and Phil, this is just for the people watching, this would have been one of the Friday afternoon labs in our export class. So this was the interactive uh, videos between the students and Sam in Tokyo. Uh, this is a very symbolic photo from Japan. And uh, this is a photo of uh, Wagyu beef. Uh, on, on the right, right hand side of these slides, uh, this is a so-called uh, uh, highest scale of a beef grade called A5 uh, uh, Wagyu um, loin. Uh, actually, re ribeye, uh, Japanese style with the cap on. And so, so Phil, that's an example. And of course, we had about uh, eight labs in which we had this type of environment and it was interactive. The next slide, Phil, if you remember, this is uh, Caleb, uh, who was in the class at the time working on a master's degree, who actually now works for Seaboard, one of the large uh, U U.S. Uh, swine uh, uh, harvest facilities. He works for them now. Well, this was Caleb in the class asking Sam Harada a question. You covered it very well. I'll turn it over to the stu students to, uh, to ask some questions. So I really appreciate everything you were, uh, all of those details you were referencing. And yeah. I was kind of wondering in terms of Japanese food culture and particularly eating with chopsticks, Mm -hmm. How difficult was it to introduce some of those new products like fajitas and consuming beef as a steak? Go ahead, Phil. This uh, it was whenever uh, it made some of the newspapers, the daily livestock in, in Tokyo. Yeah, well, what's uh, again, the vision of Dr. Belk and Dr. Morgan is, is exemplary. And we started the CSU uh, uh, Trade Excellence Center. And we started t teaching this class. Of course, a lot of what we were teaching was based on, on a lot of what was done in Japan. And when the Japanese government heard about this class, there was even remarks in the press because it was covered in the press that CSU was doing this class on international trade. And if you're a, a country that's an importer, you want your, your suppliers to be as knowledgeable as possible about trade. You, they, they, and so they started reporting that CSU was doing this and they look at it from the buyer standpoint or from the importer standpoint of saying, this is gonna make it even more better for us as importers, as an import country, to have people more knowledgeable about what we're looking for, understanding what, what our needs are and understanding our food culture and where we're going in the future. So I thought that was really a compliment that the, the Ministry of Agriculture in Japan actually did say that. And of course, this is, uh, I think this is the last slide, but this is the, the Trade Excellence Center that uh, Dr. Morgan and Dr. Bell uh, started. And it, um, 
it, it's basically uh, an effort by us uh, working to to do that, to to bring the reality uh, of the foreign markets, of the international markets, uh, to the U.S. and to prepare our the students here at CSU, which I like to call not just students but actually tomorrow's leaders, uh, uh, more in touch, uh, so they can gain that cultural fluency to be more successful in the international marketplace. There's a, the next slide will show two examples. Uh, this is Wagyu. Uh, on the left, we're doing a project of uh, CSU Tech, uh, understanding more about the opportunity for Wagyu and what was, what's necessary for Wagyu to be successful in the United States. There's another, another uh, uh, the picture of the lady here with the product is, is down in Mexico. CSU Tech is also doing some work on total carcass utilization which is one thing that we really value because it's not just the loins that we export. Uh, we export tons of variety meats. We export tons of outside meats and thin meats. And so all of this has a lot to do with maximizing the carcass and, and, and the value of the carcass to the international marketplace. So I know right now we're probably getting very close to the, our limit. Uh, if there's any questions, I, I'm sure Brad's gonna be more than happy to try to answer them or, and I will as well. Thanks, Phil. And one, one word, uh, folks out there, we are teaching the class again. It will start uh, the second eight weeks of the semester. Uh, I think it's the second week of March. We've got a couple of spots available, undergrad or graduate students. And the slides that Phil talked about used today, those were just a few of the slides that we pulled out of the class. Uh, and so we get into a lot more depth in class, obviously. But it's a unique opportunity. And, and it's the only class like it, in my opinion, that, that I know of in the United States. So we're very fortunate to have Phil that comes up and teaches it with us uh, each week. So Diana and, and Sarah, uh, we'll open it up for questions if there are any. So folks, there's a Q and A boxes uh, down below. You can enter any of your questions there or raise your hand. We've got just a few more minutes left in the session. Um, so, so please feel free to ask any questions. I know I learned a lot in this session. <laughs> it was really interesting. So thank you so much for the presentation. This class seems so interesting. I think if I had time, I would take it. <laughs> it was not an area of mine at all. We, we encourage you to come. We want the class to be as experiential as possible. I mean, you can read about sushi and you can read about, but until you taste it, you don't know it. And so it's, to, to experience the international marketplace, that's really what, what it's all about. Well, I can't wait to get to Japan one of these days. There you go. <laughs> I have to ask for some recommendations. <laughs> we can do that. Well, you know, I'm not seeing any questions coming through the chat, so I think it might be an okay place to end, if that's all right with you two. Well, I want to thank you for, oh, wait, maybe there's some that could pop in right now. So there's one that says, how are we maximizing exports to other countries or areas that include smaller farms and processing? And then the next question is, will this course focus on trading between US and Asia. And there, so there's two questions in the, in the chat. Yeah, I think number one is one of the things that uh, uh, obviously that we will talk about, of course, would be smaller business. We've had guests on that been from trading companies that are very small. Um, and, and so I think that uh, when I talk about Tyson and Cargill and some of those big companies, uh, I don't mean to exclude the smaller companies because they have customers and they work very hard and actually, those people are the pathfinders. They usually go into the markets first and they start creating, uh, you know, not full containers, but they build the market and they work in the market and they introduce the products in the market. And then the big guys usually come in and follow after that when there's enough substance in the market. So there's a lot of work that we do with, with the smaller companies. And the second question was, I'm sorry. Second question is, will this course mainly focus on trading between Asia and the U.S.? Is there a section for Argentina or Uruguay? Well, there's, there's, uh, uh, we definitely focus on uh, the Asian markets from the standpoint of China, Japan, Korea, but also we focus on Europe, Mexico, uh, of course, uh, South America and some of the developing markets. Um, so uh, yeah, it takes that in. And we, we, we can adjust this course as we go along too. That's the, that's the beauty of some of the guests that we have. Um, so yeah, we're very flexible in that respect. Wonderful. All right, well, I, I think that's uh, taken us Hey, Phil, there, there is another question, if you, if you real quick, I know we're, 
It says, how long does it take? And I want you to answer this life since you've lived in Japan. How long does it take you to gain cultural fluency? Uh, I feel this would be really hard to learn all the little details from different areas. Well, I think you know, obviously cultural fluency means that you, number one is you, you look at the market and, or you look at the country. Uh, I'd rather say just the country and you try to understand everything you can about the history, uh, the business practices, um, the history of it, if it's, if it's the meat industry, study the meat industry, you know, as much as you possibly can. The more that you can involve yourself in the market, and this is, that's depending on how much time you have, but if you can be a student of the market, uh, that's really going to lead you a long ways. And so that's why I say, if you're going to work for a company, if you can work with their customers in a certain market, you're going to gain a lot of information. Mm -hmm. Wonderful. There's a great comment. So Dr. Singh, this is one of the best presentations I've seen on the subject. I could listen to you for hours. Thank you so much. From Dr. Sandra P.H. Robnett. Well, thank you. PSU alum. Well, thank you so much for this incredible presentation and for participating in our international symposium. I hope to be able to welcome you in person sometime in a future symposium. I feel privileged. Yes. And thank you to all of our attendees for, for joining us today. And then I'd like to encourage you all to uh, fill out the survey that's going to pop up out as the session ends. And then our keynote speaker for today is, is going to be at one o'clock, and that's uh, Lulu Garcia Navarra from NPR. And so that will be really excellent as well. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Have a great day. Thanks, Bill. Bye, everyone. Bye. -bye.